Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. Um, I'm really excited to be here. I'm Polish, and I'm speaking for the first time in Poland, which is a bit awkward, but really fun. Uh, I'm here instead of Professor Idamid from the Weizmann Institute. He couldn't come because we are celebrating Jewish New Year today. Happy New Year, everybody. Um, and thank you for aligning the, the lineup like this, because my talk will be a summary, something complementary, and something building on the previous speaker's uh, presentation. So Alexandra, number one, told you that uh, the immune system is an army protecting you from the invaders, from the pathogens. So I will add to this and say that now we know that it's not only that. The immune system is actually a tissue support system. Uh, and we are discovering, I would guess, every month now with single cell technologies, that especially macrophages are doing many things that are just keeping you healthy. They are responsible for turning over the surfactant in your lungs. They are eating the tops of photoreceptors in your eyes every night so you can grow new ones in the morning. Uh, they are getting rid of protein aggregates from your brain so you can stay healthy when you're old. And now we know that they even control your heartbeat or peristaltic movement. So the problem is that we still call all these things a macrophage. Even though in different organs they do completely different things and they have completely different transcriptomic signatures. And it gets even worse because in the same organ they can be in the same, in, in different locations they can be phagocytosing, presenting antigens, interacting with the tissue, interacting with something that is coming from the blood, responding to different stimuli. So you again get different signatures for all of these things. So how do we solve it? How do we dissect it or understand it or recreate it? Um, and you already know the answer. But I will go back and again, like Alexandra did, through what immunologists usually do, which is FAGS. Uh, FAGS is this two-dimensional method where we mark uh, surface markers of cells with antibodies linked to fluorescent tags. So we can look at it in two dimensions. Uh, it's not actually two. We can do it up to eight, but we are not, at least I am not computational, so two is like maximum I can handle at a time, so we do it sequentially. Um, so, for example, here an immunologist would say that this is the cell type that is called like that. This is maybe, probably, most probably the cell type that is called CD8 positive T cells, and this is something else, maybe interesting, I don't know. Um, so, this is what we used to do. Then there was times of bug sequencing, so we would physically, as Alexandra said, take the cells that we mark a gate on. Again, this is a gate or this is a gate. And I can sort them in a tube, and I can sequence all this soup that was created there to learn something more about the cell type. But then I'm losing the heterogeneity that I do not see, right? And this is why single cell is so amazing in immunology. We can understand the, all these subtypes that we could not see before. So this is an example. This is a, let's say, tumor, and all the macrophages doing different things or the cell type is doing different things. And this is how conventional markers for facts would mark them. And this is our new marker that we found based on the data. And Alexandra's work would be a perfect example for this kind of science and how it goes in sequence. Uh, so we're doing single cell in the lab, but we're still immunologists at heart. So we love facts and we can't get rid of it. And we'll still sort ourselves. <laughs> so our method is called MARSIC, massively parallel single cell sequencing. First fabrication was this one from Diego. He's still working in the lab and developing it farther into different directions. Um, we start from an organ. We're meshing it to a single cell suspension, and we sort one cell per well to three 84 well plates based on the markers. Again, using the facts, the fluorescent markers that we like so much. Um, we go through uh, RT, we go to amplification with in vitro transcription, um, then another amplification with PCR, we are adding humus, we are adding barcodes for the cell, for the plate. Total, we can sequence, um, I don't know, 10 to, no, 20 plus 
thousand cells in every run of NextSec. So, and this is what we get at the end. Again, you probably you are familiar with this picture. Uh, differentially expressed genes separating the cells into different subclusters, which some of them we may be familiar with, but some of them are new. Um, and this is, yeah, this is just an example in the first publication. This method identified cells that were predicted to be, or we know that they are there, but we found them without using any markers for facts. Um, and this is also summarizing what Alexandra said. Because we are using facts, we can start from a gate that, let's say, is very broad. We are using maybe one marker. And we are sorting cells based on this. We analyze them. We see the granularity thanks to single cell RNA sequencing. We have this TSNI plot. And then we want to fish out the cells that are interesting using facts. So we will be going through cycles of um, depletion of the abundant cells that are not interesting or enriching the interesting cells based on the informed uh, analysis of the single cell sequencing. And because we are using this fax thing, uh, and it's based on fluorescence, together with the single cell data, we can also add some fluorescent fun stuff. So we are doing the surface markers, sure, but we recently also started doing reporter assays or pulse chase experiments so, or phagocytosis of something fluorescent. So we can say, have cells in a dish, give them something fluorescent to eat. Whoever ate, you can fish it out with facts and you can analyze only them, this kind of stuff. Also in the morning, uh, Michela mentioned niche sec. So we are looking at the tissue of a mouse that can be photoactivated. It means that you look at the tissue with a microscope, you pick your favorite spot based on whatever different markers, you illuminate it with UV, and this will shine in GFP with a green tag. Then you can make a soup out of this, single cell suspension out of this tissue and fish out only the green cells. So you can trace back where they were before. Um, yeah, so this is how we can um, make more of single cell sequencing, adding these extra layers of information on the top of the sequencing. So, so this is again uh, some of the things that we do. We do pulse chase experiments. We can, uh, to some extent, solve the special organization of cells. Um, we're thinking about doing this to see how, they, how the cells are interacting and what happens upon the interaction between two different cell types, which in immunology, in immunology is specifically fun to do because of the antigen presentation. Uh, also, clonal relationships in immunology is very important. So who is the mother cell of the cells that you see later on? You can do it with fluorescence, but it's way more fun with barcodes in DNA. Another thing that we did was perturbation using uh, CRISPR. So we combined people familiar with CRISPR? Screens? Great. So now instead of doing knockout mouse and looking at cells in every mouse, you can take cells, make a different knockout in every cell, and then you take your cells to sequencing, you know the transcriptome, and you know what kind of knockout you did. Um, and we're also working on this, on trying to figure out uh, T cell and B cell clones, so specificity to antigen plus transcriptome. So what the cell recognizes and what's the signature, what's the function. Some of it is published, some of it is under construction. If you want more explanation, just ask later. So now Alzheimer's disease. Everybody, everybody familiar with Alzheimer's disease? Nobody? That's awesome, okay. Exactly, that's why I need this. So, oh, by the way, you work on cancer, right? Look, five times more money in Alzheimer's disease. <laughs> so Alzheimer's disease is terrible. It's like in the movies when they, the older people don't remember names of their kids, this is Alzheimer's disease. And the worst part of it is that it starts 20 years before, so you have no idea that you're sick, before it's really bad. So what happens 20 years before? So if this is the brain, now, people from the spatial transcriptomics will kill me, but it looks like that, more or less. This is hippocampus area, and this is cortex above it. So this is where you start developing uh, plaques, amyloid beta plaques, 
it's called. And they are just aggregates of uh, peptide created from wrong cutting of amyloid beta precursor or, or amyloid precursor protein. They create beta sheets, they aggregate, they grow bigger and bigger. And given how the structure of the brain is super important, they disrupt it completely and you start losing your memories. So the most fun part for us about Alzheimer's disease is that it's really related to immunology, apparently. If you look at the uh, GWAS or other studies trying to relate mutations in humans to uh, prevalence of Alzheimer, you find that there is many, actually more than half mutations, are related to immunity somehow. Also, epidemiological studies were trying to connect your, your peripheral immune system and your risk of getting Alzheimer's. But for many years, people knew that something is there but couldn't quite get, put a hand on it. Uh, but we have this new amazing technology. So maybe with this, we can see something that we couldn't see before. So this is the simplest experiment in the conditions you can do. Uh, luckily, there is a mouse model of Alzheimer's. We don't have to slice anyone, even though I tried, but it didn't work. Uh, Post-mortem. <laughs> we took a normal mouse, wild type, and a mouse that is engineered to produce too much of amyloid beta. They get plaques very early. Um, they also have a cognitive loss. So they don't learn, they don't remember, and we have ways to measure it. Uh, so we took just the brain and we took all the immune cells from the brain for our MARSIC. So in the two-dimensional way, we just focused on fluorescent marker for CD45, which is all the immune cells. Give me immune cells. I don't care about subsets at the moment. And after, this, uh, after the analysis, this is what we got. It was mostly predictable. So we got neutrophils, T cells, B cells, monocyte macrophages, Microglia are the cells that I already mentioned. They're resident macrophages of the brain. They're supposed to phagocyte those dead cells. They're supposed to produce neurotrophic factors. They're supposed to support the, the tissue. And then we go, got a weirdo. So this is cells that partially look like these, like microglia, but they don't have these things. Like this is new in them. So who are they? If you look at TISNA, they're also weird. So this is microglia, the basic stuff that everybody has. But this is our cells that are weird and we didn't expect to see. The orange and the red, microglia 2 and 3. And then if you look where they're coming from, because on the TISNA we plot both wild type and Alzheimer's, these are coming only from Alzheimer's mice. So we found a disease-associated cell type. So this is all the rest of the cell type distribution is equal, but this uh, microglia 2 and 3 only coming from AD. So and now you call a type cell type because it will have a different expression, right? It's, it's so confusing. I'm not going to like have an opinion on this. Okay. We I can just want to understand what you, like, people are talking about when they say... So Alexandra also... that was talking before me knows better. People from Human Cell Atlas know. I think that in immunology we have uh, cell type is something that is like in, in the history of, uh, based on fax markers, we define cell type. And now we have like... But this is not based on markers, on? this is based on gene expression. Just yes, you exactly. Know, this based on gene expression. I would just call it cell type, but what, you can have your own opinion. I'm I not gonna, I'm gonna protect it. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. This, this is another thing. We need to develop a way of how to speak about this stuff, uh, especially in immunology. It's so confusing. So, um, so we want to see whether this cell st status, whatever, is related somehow to the disease, right? So we started from uh, facts because it's the only thing we can do. Uh, <laughs> we took again wild type and AD, but this time we took differentially hippocampus and cortex, or cortex only, from what I remember. So this is the area where um, AD is supposed to develop, and we also took cerebellum, which has nothing to do with the disease. There, is, there shouldn't be plaques there. It's supposed to be clean. It's supposed to be fine. And if you, um, if you run single cell, again, of all the cell types of immune cells, that's it, on this, 
you only get the red cell type, the microglia 3 and 2 in orange, which you can't probably see, uh, only here in the cortex of AD mice. Cerebellum of AD mice is, yeah, is here and has very little cells of this kind, which tells us partially that it may be related to the disease. And again, here we can see enrichment by the, uh, which cell type was where. And from this point on, we started calling our cells disease-associated microglia, the damn cells, which we didn't know what we were doing. Never mind. Um, so when you look at differentially expressed genes between a regular microglia that everybody has, including Alzheimer's mice, versus our special microglia disease-associated, we can see this set of genes. And then let's do again the exercise that you did in the previous lecture. And let's try to use this to somehow learn more about them and reach for them, have a deeper uh, insight into their biology. So we started with localizing them even more. So one of the genes that was so specific was CD11C. It's usually found on dendritic cells. It's not so obvious, especially on microglia. Um, EBA1 is on all, all microglia, and DAPI is something that you always find in the nucleus. It marks DNA. Um, and then A beta, the plaque, is in white. So what you can see around the plaque is colocalization of the green, C11C, and EBA1, which tells us that disease-associated microglia are associated with the plaque. So they're actually at the heart of where the disease starts. And even more importantly, we could take the same approach and go for uh, human samples, which are so just hard to get. But if you can have a paraffin section, it's not that bad. So again, we took LPL, one of the genes that was super high in our disease-associated microglia, stained for it, and we found that uh, cells having it in were also associated with uh, teoflavin as marked uh, Alzheimer plaque. So then um, when we had a look at these genes again, we started looking at them deeper, studying about them, reading about them, what they do, what can be their role and contribution to the pathology. We found that actually many of them are their genes associated in GWAS with Alzheimer's disease. So for example, if you have mutation in APOE that causes downregulation of APOE, you have higher chance of Alzheimer's. And in our cells, this protein is high. You have it low, you get Alzheimer's. They have it high, suggesting cells can be protective. Another one was uh, TREM2, which is like number two uh, hype in Alzheimer's disease after APOE. Same story, you have it knocked out, there is Another disease that is genetic, specifically if you, if you don't have it working, you will have neurodegeneration, but ours does have it high. The correlation is reverse. So we followed TREM2 and how its expression is changing in, uh, uh, in our cells or along the pseudotype of transition from homostatic microglia to disease-associated microglia. We also knew before that uh, yeah, genetic variants associated with increased risk of neurodegeneration have it down, or it's mutated in people with higher risk. We also knew that TREM2 deficient mice that have Alzheimer's have more disease. They have more amyloid in the, in the hippocampus and they show neuronal loss. 5-FAT is the model of, of Alzheimer's disease in mice. Um, and then we also knew that TREM2 is involved in phagocytosis. So here we have the theory of TREM2, we hope, is involved in phagocytosing the amyloid plaques. So it eats them away to keep brain healthy. You don't have it, you have higher chance of accumulating plaques and Alzheimer's disease. And that's why our cells are potentially important because they have it high. Can I ask a question? Sure. Because before, on the slide before, you showed that <coughs> the genes in the microglia. Yeah. And now on the next slide, the information on the next slide, the blue one, Yeah. Uh, the next one, uh, this Here. information is about brain cells, all cells. Uh, we, we're talking about uh, TREM to uh, genetic mutation, so all body is affected. All body, yes. Okay. Yeah. Um, so yeah. So check for the uh, uh, 
expression of this gene in other cells? I mean, uh, those which have high expression of those genes, the stem cells, they have the high expression of this gene? Yes. What about other cells in the body? Some, some macrophages, especially ones involved in phagocytosis, will have it high. Also, um, TREM2 is a sensor of lipids, and plaques are often associated with lipids that are hydrophobic. So fat macrophages also have it. And then probably I can predict, for example, that bone marrow macrophages with age, that you accumulate more fat, will also have it. Yeah, it's heavily involved in phagocytosis. But your like normal microglia that you al that you also have in the, sa the same mice that have I mean because it's a bit confusing when you say that the same gene is associated to, uh, in Alzheimer's disease to be actually high, but in your cells it's down and the other way around. So that yeah, the other way. That in your own mice also in all other cell types that you were analyzing all immune cell types, but not your micro special dumb thing, uh, <laughs> is <laughs> they are actually reversely expressed. You mean what, you know what I mean? So because you're saying normally they are high, but in our dumb cells they are down. No, so the are opposite. they also in the same mice in all other cells? So let's write it down. Trim to knockout or mutated. In human, they have higher AD. Not like full spectrum, they have more plaques, there is like details there, but let's, let's keep it like this. And this is by germline mutation? Yes, mutated, full body, full mouse. Yeah, but if it's full body, then it means the say the old, maybe other immune types that you have been analyzing also have it. Not so okay. Uh, maybe so. Let's go uh, step back to general immunology of the brain. Uh, brain is very isolated. The immune cells in the brain, uh, the the going in on out, practically doesn't happen. There is very very little number of other cell types than microglia. And within the when you take out the brain and analyze the cells, microglia are the only cells having trem to expressed. And now in the in the dam cells, it's even higher. Okay. It's significantly higher. Cells have the same gene in all no, 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 no. Just... No. Then you get Alzheimer's. This is not good. <laughs> we all have a TREM2 gene, but it's only expressed in specific macrophages, including microglia. But then in, uh, the disease-associated microglia is super high. People that have the mutation that is like the worst kind have also have bone cysts. They have other problems, the, the knockout people. Um, but in the context of Alzheimer's disease, we're specifically looking at microglia because not many other cells are infiltrating to the brain. Brain is very isolated. The blood-brain barrier. Um, generally, immune activities in the brain, if they're as robust and I don't know, in your skin, if you get scratched, this would kill many cells. This is not good in the organ that doesn't regenerate so well. So, okay, so in my dumb cells are trend to high, which suggests that they may be good guys because trend to is supposed to be protective. So let's just simplify it and keep it like this. So, Actually, we can't because we now have a knockout and Alzheimer's in the same mouse. So this is exactly what we did. We, we made a knockout and we analyzed the cells. And don't pay attention to this. Let's say we again did all the immune cells. And we are looking at the cell types that we got. And this is only, uh, so this is our control. This is a wild type mouse that has TREM2 deficiency. We are looking at microglia only. And the only gene changing is TREM2. Nothing happens. It doesn't matter. Mice are happy. But now we have them crossed to Alzheimer's disease. And this is what we observe. If you take all the microglia, including this disease associated and everything that looks microglia-like, this is the TSNE that we get. And it, it, this is the kind of soda time. So you go from homostatic microglia, and this is our disease associated, and you have this middle stage. 
And we see that wild type mice only have homeostatic. AD mice have many, many uh, diseases associated. TREM2, Alzheimer are stuck in the middle with their disease associated microglia. So they never assume the full phenotype. They're stuck in something that we call stage one disease associated microglia. So just to remind you, these mice also have more plaques and more cognitive deficits. Not exactly, not everybody agrees. Um, but Alzheimer's is worse in them. Uh, so at this step, at this stage, we can say that you can have partial activation of the DAM program without TREM2, but for, for the full differentiation, you need TREM2. So there is the TREM2 independent and dependent steps. And now, um, so this is where we stop the characterizing the pathway that could be inducing them. And we uh, looked at other brain problems that cause similar phenotype. So in aging, for example, and here we also have ALS. So this is just young and old mice. And we see uh, we are looking at the same projection. We saw that old mice, no mutations, just happy, potentially healthy, just two years old. They also have these associated microglia. Not as many, but they do. We also looked at the ILS model. Um, Amyotropic lateral sclerosis is the motor neuron disease that Stephen Hawking had very light. But people with this disease actually often die within five years. It's a terrible, terrible thing. And there is a mouse model of this. So these mice also showed some signs of having a disease associated microglia of a very, very similar phenotype to the disease associated microglia that we found in Alzheimer's disease. Now, others also found similar signature in. Um, Again, this is Alzheimer's. So this is a model of ALS. And EAE is experimental autoimmune encephalomyelitis is a model of multiple sclerosis, another terrible disease that, uh, in, uh, where immune system invades the brain. So also their microglia are different and they're different in the same direction as we saw in Alzheimer's. So taking a guess and calling the cell type disease associated, not Alzheimer's associated was a Good guess, because it's broader than we observed at the beginning. So now we have a theory that um, becoming disease-associated microglia uh, is probably a protective program that is induced by can be induced by various fun various factors. It can be amyloid beta plaques. It can be degenerating neurons, as it is observed in amyotropic lateral sclerosis and multiple sclerosis. But we also have other conditions where we suspect that disease-associated microglia would arise. And part of the work in the lab now is to find whether it is indeed true and whether it is indeed true in humans. And whether these programs of disease-associated microglia are indeed the same in all of these conditions. So to summarize, am I early? <laughs> to summarize, um, it says we found a new cell type. No, I don't know. <laughs> maybe it's a cell state, or maybe we'll, we'll have a better nomenclature in a few months. Let's see. Uh, but we found a cell something, kind, that is disease-associated, that we also found in humans, that is potentially protective. And we found one factor that is involved in induction of this pathway that creates these associated microglia. So we are currently working to find out what are the other factors that are contributing to this pathway and whether we can boost them to protect mice and then people from Alzheimer's. And this is us. The work was mostly done by Hadas and Raz and Asaf. And there is like 20 people here. Where is Ido? He's hiding, that's typical. Here, this is all. Uh, we have many collaborators. Actually, in terms of analysis, Asaf is doing it, but this is the guy writing our scripts. So we have like no idea what we are doing. We're just applying what he found out. <laughs> no, he's actually really good. And if you're a computational biologist and you want to join our lab, you're more than welcome to contact us. And uh, yeah, let's have fun together. Thank you. Any questions? Uh, let's, uh, uh, let's start over there. Yes. Ah.
I was wondering if this, this activation process you described, is it reversible? Is it, can you actually see it going in the reverse direction? Whoa. <laughs> I, I know nobody asked this question, but I have an idea of how to do it. <laughs> uh, that would be terrible, right? Because once you have a chance, so, we, so let's imagine this. The plaque arises, microglia are coming, surrounding it. Now we know better about microglia also. They eat the plaque. They also create a barrier around it so it cannot grow anymore. So if there is a factor that can get this reverse, it would be terrible. The plaque will grow and it gets worse. And I can imagine that, um, so the factor that is kind of pushing away this phagocytosis pathway is inflammation. So I think if like on the top of that you have a stroke, that's not good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, I think that's possible. Okay. It's awesome. So I just kind of want to comment as well. Uh, did, did you have a look at the microglia response, for instance, in cancer, for instance, from glioma? Because some of the genes that you showed, I see in my microglia response towards glioma, and it's more like neuroprotective slash immunosuppressive as well, response uh, towards cancer. So I think what you see over there in your PCA plot uh, is kind of cell response towards an inflammation, so maybe some sort of, or not? Some sort of signal? Yes. Yeah, inflammation is, cells yeah. Here, yeah. It's just that the cells exactly. it's not a different such a way, but it's also quite similar yeah. to a response that we see in cancer. So do you think that it's uh, like better or worse for brain uh, metastasis? Uh, in, in your terms, uh, I think it, it's protective, but in cancer, uh, the microglia turns on the immunosuppression, which drives tumor growth. Exactly. Uh, so it's kind of this conflict dependent. Yeah. yeah. So th that's why we like to call them sensors at the moment, mm -hmm. and then to go to specific diseases. To this, to if you want to ascribe the function, you have to be careful. Exactly for this reason. Thank you. This is really useful. Okay. Let's have a final question. Yeah. I'm interested. Do you know when in the development of Alzheimer's uh, do those uh, cells show themselves? As, so in mice, because in humans, unpredictable. In mice, the, from the moment you have plaques in the mouse, which in five fat can be three months, depending on the animal facility, from this moment you start seeing them. And then they, there is more and more in correlation with the amount of plaques in the brain. Can you use it for early detection of the disease in humans? Uh, we have problems identifying the, the plaques themselves. Right, it with imaging. Yeah, but maybe so it would be easier to detect the cells. I understand. So, yeah, maybe giving something uh, metabolic markers, some some of this kind. Yeah, this this could be really useful. Let me think about it. This was good. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Thank you.